Today we're going to look at an old vintage Polaroid camera. This is a film camera going way back, way back, with a um, kind of unique flash assembly. Let's take a look at this unit. I figured today, you know, before I got down to doing any type of repairs on any of the crap that's sitting around here, I would show off some stuff that I've been given over the years, and uh, this is an old camera. One of the one of the cameras I've been given over the years, but this is a kind of a, a unique one. It's an old LAN camera, old Polaroid model 160 LAN camera, and I remember these growing up as a kid. You know, had I had relatives that that had one, and uh, we were always fascinated by it, being able to just get the picture right out of the camera. Now, of course, the film for this is completely obsolete now, although this one does have film in it. Um, I think it opens from the back here, but this film that's in here is, is obviously not going to be any good because it's been sitting around for, you know, for, for eons. But anyway, um, that's the, uh, that's the, I think this is the paper for it, the film. Yeah, the film comes out from the back is what it is. And uh, basically what you did is when you took the picture, you pulled the, the film out and it, it pressed the film there's a there's a pack of on here this is where the chemicals lived was in here so when you when you this would be your your negative side this is what faces the camera and this is the roll of of p paper that gets developed to so say this is all shot now you, you can't be used because the chemicals here the caustic chemicals have all dried up so this is just basically for demonstration but you put the film in the camera under this plate and I think you may even be able to get some replica film for these now I'm not sure the company went bankrupt years ago but I understand there's some companies that now that are now making some old film for some of these old cameras but anyway there's where the film goes your your contact negative goes there and um, basically uh, what happens is when you when you take a picture, this is, looks like the last picture on the roll too, right there. That's the last picture. You can see that, that the roll is right at the end there. When you uh, take a picture, it gets exposed onto the negative, which is this side. And then you pull the negative out. And um, basically what it does is... When you pull the negative it squeezes between this roller here and there's another roller here on the, on the back when you pull it it squeezes the packet of chemicals which are included with the paper this is the roll of paper here right. see that was the end of it there it's actually two and a bit left on here squeezes the chemicals between the two rollers which causes the package to burst and the chemicals then get rolled between the paper and the contact negative and the image then develops between the contact negative and the paper it develops on the paper itself and then you used to have to after the print was done you would uh, put a, a, a coating on you brushed on a coating like that like was a uh, like a foam brush and you would fix the uh, image on the, the actual paper otherwise your Polaroid image would fade that was one of the, the downsides to Polaroid so when you loaded your film you put your your film in the camera like that and closed the back and then it was ready to go once you once the back was closed up I've never used one of these cameras, so I don't know exactly how they work, but it gives you the instructions here. Okay, you focus, you take the picture, you snap this switch in either direction to release the film so you can pull the tab to develop the picture. It says when you pull the tab, you're actually you're advancing for the next picture, so you pull this either way. One time you flip it one way, the next time you flip it the next way. Then you would pull the picture out, and that would pull your exposed print out and then you would uh, tear it off and let it develop wait the recommended developing time after waiting for development 
open this door and lift out the finished picture. Okay, so what that would do is when you pulled the tab, the picture is actually stored in the back here on these ones. So once your picture was developed, you would do that and then you grabbed your print here, grabbed it by the tab and took the print out and the, the previously exposed negative would still be sitting in here with the chemicals and stuff still on it, it would eventually dry up and then when you took the next picture you'd be basically using the tab that would stick out of the camera here you would use the tab to there it is grab the film and pull it so I could probably do this now because I've, there's no chemicals on this but I could grab the film and pull it like this right and then I would tear off pull the clothes bar tear it I'm not going to do it because I've only got this little bit of paper here but you would tear off you'd be pulling this part right because the, the print was already lifted from the previous picture and then once your print was developed you would open the back peel the next print out close it and just leave it for the next for the next operation and of course this is now as you can see it's locked this is now locked if I flip this tab again I can now pull lock there. If I flip it, I can now pull the last one out like that. We're going to load this back in here just for, just for, because this is just a, a display, this camera, I just, I just leave it on display. So when you get, when you had a new roll of film, you would just open it up, drop the film in here, drop the, the, the print paper over on that side. So let me just wind this back in and then we're going to look at the camera a little closer. You see when I was growing up in the 60s my parents could never afford an instant camera but my my rich uncle had one so I got to see the one of these cameras this is not his camera this was given to me by somebody else but uh, I got to see the camera used once in a while I remember pulling the pictures out and letting it time timing them and getting the pictures I thought it was so cool getting an instant picture the first Polaroid camera I had myself, actually, did I ever have? I think I had the I had the Kodak, um, I had the Kodak Instant Camera, which is the one that Polaroid they had their SX70 at the time, which was the film pack that spit the, the pictures out the front of the camera. I always thought the SX70 was kind of a cool camera, but I had the I had the Kodak Instant Camera when I was a kid, and I remember I was so upset when I got this I got this letter in the mail, a package in the mail, with a big bag in it and I think it was like a five dollar bill or something and uh, Kodak had to buy all the cameras back for everybody and I think they gave us five bucks and we put the camera into the bag and dropped it in the mailbox because they they were ordered by uh, Polaroid sued Kodak over their instant camera and they were ordered to recall all the cameras and of course um, being the obedient kid that I was I was probably only about 12 at the time uh, I put it in the mailbox I should have kept that camera even though they weren't going to be there was going to be no more film for it because um, Polaroid sued Kodak over that instant camera so they couldn't make film for it anymore and they couldn't sell the cameras where was I before I was rudely interrupted by a text message um, yeah Kodak couldn't sell the cameras anymore they couldn't sell the film because uh, they got sued by Polaroid anyway um, that, that was my that was my entry into instant photography but this this camera I love this camera I use it just as a prop I leave this just sitting on a shelf in my living room because I think it's so cool camera opens up and you pull the actual it's a bellows camera you pull it out and it locks into place somewhere here it locks there it is and this is where you would set your uh, how many feet to the lens your subject is if you can see down here and it's that's how you adjust your your focus on this is uh, I think that one's the that's the that's the exposure you can see the exposure reading here F10 17 16 15 right I think it goes to a 10 and then it goes back to 17 so this is that's the iris control uh, this was uh, a normal shutter or, or a B, which is like keeps the shutter open for 
for uh, long-term exposure. Made in Japan. This camera was made in Japan. And then there's a shutter release up top here. This is the shutter release here. And where do we where do we do? I think that's the shutter release. Could be mistaken. Oh, it's down here. That's this is for uh, putting on a, a release cable. Shutter releases there. Every time you press it, it just will take a picture. So you could do multiple exposures. And this one here, that holds the shutter open until you release it. You see. So this one, that's your that's this is the time of the shutter. How long it's going to stay open? I think. Yeah. That's that's the shutter speed and you'll hear it double click see the different you can hear it and you can see how long the shutter stays open and then this one here was 17 that is so that's much faster this is probably a tenth of a second and this is like 1 70th I don't know their numbers somebody probably knows that it'd be abbreviated I'm sure it's on here somewhere, probably written on the back somewhere, or in the manual. And then you set your distance to your to your uh, subject. That was done by turning the, the knob on the front here. This was for your focus. So you'd set your distance. And I don't know whether the, the eyepiece on this actually did focusing. I'm just going to look through it here. I think it does have a split. Yes, it does. So it, on the back here, it's a parallax type of viewfinder so there's two viewfinders on the back the left range finder and this is your focusing that's what it says there the range finder piece here when you rotate the focus lens it's got a parallax in there I don't know if you guys can see it or not but uh, it uh, it uses a mirror and gives you a double image so when you focus if you're focusing on something you line it up so that uh, you know it splits it and you line it up with that just like a conventional rangefinder camera it's hard to see on on video here but I don't know whether we're able to get a shot through here and actually have it uh, show up or not let's see let's see whether I can pick this up on my camera and give you guys the effect let's see if I can get this rangefinder to show up on camera here when I turn the dial whether you're going to see anything change or not, probably not but anyway that's uh, that's how you focus, this one was your viewfinder and this one here give you the split image anyway the, the image that you saw, the viewfinder gave you the full scene that the camera was going to take in the rangefinder with just a cropped um, version of the center portion of the screen and that's what you would adjust your focus to and it was done with these three lenses on the front here as you can see one big lens and then this is the range finder and this is the other part of the focusing finder and uh, when you when you move the adjustment you'll see inside this lens you'll see it moving And that would change the superimposition or, or superimposing. That would change the superimposing of the two images together, and then you just line it up so that the two images overlapped, and that was your in focus uh, point. And that was the that's the camera itself. And there's a little pin here when you press when you close that up. I think it locked it so that it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't you couldn't uh, accidentally take a picture when it was closed. Uh, anyway, I say I just I just keep this on display because I think it's kind of cool. I just have it sitting in my living room, just sitting up. I actually I think I keep it sitting like that because I think it looks better sitting like that. And you know you would take it. It has a tripod mount, so you could take your landscape pictures this way, or take your portrait pictures that way. It also came with this flash unit, which I don't have any flash bulbs for it, but it, I found it interesting because it has an incandescent light here. They call it a wink light, and then the flash bulb went on top here. I, I could be wrong. Uh, all I know is that this thing here, it uses uh, a really special battery. Another obsolete, another very obsolete uh, battery that you'll 
probably never see these days. If I open this thing up, it will reveal that it uses a 45 volt battery. This is battery may be used in any position. It's a it's a, just a standard zinc carbon battery. I know some of you might like to see this thing opened up and see what's inside it. That's not going to happen because it's part of this this old collector camera. I don't want to destroy anything. Um, but uh, it hasn't leaked, and this battery itself will be completely dry now. What would be inside this thing would be equivalent to what you would have found in nine volt batteries of the day. It's going to have just a, a, a bunch of little small, um, usually they were square, flat cells, little, little pancake type cells that would be just all lined up, one and a half volts each, in series with each other. There would be 30 cells in here. I'm thinking they're probably the same type of cells that would have been in nine volt batteries. Because if we look at a nine volt cell, if I can find one around here. Now whereas the nine volt battery had six cells stacked in them, uh, the alkaline batteries use cylindrical cells, but the original ones actually use flat. They were flat uh, zinc carbon cells and there would be six of them from one end to the other, connected in series to give you nine volts. This one uses 30. You can see if you look at the width of the battery, there's enough width for basically for two of them side by side and two cells side by side. So there's enough room for four 9 volt style of, of the, uh, the the single cells, right? Four of them plus you've got extra height to make up your 45 volts. As you can see at the height of a single battery here, if you had four, four 9 volt batteries in there, you'd have uh, 24 cells. You need 30 cells to make up 45 volts, so there's the extra height right there. So these batteries would have used the same type of cells that were used in the old 9 volt dry batteries. They're just a, a rectangular cell and they'd be stacked. As you can see, they would have them arranged in such a way to be the equivalent of, of five 9 volt batteries connected in series. So 30 of the individual cells. You'd have two stacks of them this way, right? And then double stack that way and then one additional one additional one would be in equivalent to this direction. Be a little bit of padding in here, I'm sure a little bit of a, of a cardboard or whatever they use for packing the battery just to fill the void. But anyway, 30 cells make up the 45 volts and that's used to trigger the flash. Inside here there's also looks like a capacitor in here. Maybe we'll take this thing apart. It uses a, a type um, what is this? It's a GE428 bulb. Let's look up the voltage on that. So GE428 bulb is actually a 12.5 volt. Let's just take a look because putting 45 volts across that thing is going to... Oh, it looks like that's, uh, that bulb is... How is it connected here? It's connected across the, the terminals that go up to the flash. Interesting. Interesting how this is designed. We're going to take a closer look at uh, how this thing is laid out. Looks like the, the, the voltage from the battery goes through a resistor, it looks like. I think the easiest way to understand this is to actually take it right apart and take a look at how they've how they've wired this this flash assembly. So we'll take that out. This is just a spring that lock that locks it together. That piece comes off like that. I'm going to take out this. Note on the back says allow 15 seconds to recharge between winks. Let's just see how this, this is uh, placed in here. There's a capacitor in the bottom here. And what 
what size is this capacitor? This is an 860 microfarad at 50 volts DC. So what this does, if we look at the layout of the wiring, here's the positive terminal. Negative terminal of the battery goes to here. Positive terminal of the battery goes over to this resistor. You can see that. And the resistor then is connected to this terminal here, which, which goes to the pin of the of the hot shoe. It's also connected to the positive terminal for the capacitor that was in there. Because that's not touching this when the battery is in place. When the battery is out of place, this terminal shorts out the capacitor. You see? This terminal shorts out the capacitor. When the battery is in place, the battery pushes that terminal out of the way. And this was, uh, was grounded through this screw here. Okay, got this thing figured out how it works. Quite, actually quite ingenious. The hot shoe here is actually not hot. There's actually a contact underneath here. You'll see the, the copper contact right down here. When you put this on the camera, the, the metal bracket of the camera would actually make contact with this contact underneath here and would provide continuity from one side over to the other. What that did was that connected the negative terminal of the battery, which is this one, uh, where is it here? Negative terminal, this is this one, because the battery sits in like that. It would connect the negative terminal across from one side to the other. If we measure here, we'll see that the negative terminal is connected to here, underneath here. Right, so that would apply the connection across here when it, when it was mounted on the camera. That would supply the negative terminal, which now comes down underneath the capacitor here, goes up through this contact, if we look here, goes up through this contact, through the light bulb, and from there it's connected to the negative terminal of the capacitor. If you notice, if I remove the light bulb, oops, I guess i got to take it right out. There we go. We remove the light bulb, we no longer have continuity. So what this does is this provides a power switch. So when the when the flash is attached to the camera, and only when the flash is attached to the camera, will the capacitor charge. You put the flash on the camera, it completes the circuit through the light bulb, and of course through this uh, 1K resistor, it's going to charge the capacitor up because there is a 1K resistor connected to the uh, to the positive terminal of the battery, which would then supply the positive voltage in. Now, you notice that this shorts now when I touch here. With no battery in place, it actually puts a short across the capacitor through the 1K resistor. This is actually quite a unique way that this thing operates. I've just been kind of studying the way that it's set up. So when you, you are charging the capacitor, positive is on this terminal flowing through this resistor it puts a positive charge on this side which then goes to the capacitor to charge it up your negative goes through the the switching of the of the uh, base here from the or the act of a switch by attaching it to the camera it completes continuity across here to, to provide the negative voltage which flows underneath the capacitor flows through the light bulb It'll also flow through the uh, the, the uh, flash bulb itself. It's not going to have enough current to fire the flash. You're going to have some current going through the, the little filament that's part of a flash bulb that ignites it, but you're going to have most of it going through this little light bulb here as the uh, as the capacitor comes up to charge through this 1K resistor. Because just the way it's wired, negative terminal here, this is negative, it's connected to First of all, the one side of the light bulb, but also goes through the flash unit. And you can see that this wire here, or this lead, is connected to the other side of the light bulb. So these are in parallel. The flash bulb and the incandescent bulb are in parallel. So you will see some light on here. Now, if you tried to operate the camera without a flash on it, 
this would would actually light up and dump the full 45 volts. So that might be what they, they meant by a wink light, was this could be used as a close-up without burning a flash bulb. Again, this is before my time. I'd, I'm, I'm speculating there, but the two of them are connected in parallel with each other. So if you had a flash bulb plugged in, when you took a picture, the flash bulb would go, and if you didn't, it would flash through this incandescent bulb, which probably wouldn't make much difference because back in this day, this would have been black and white film. So color temperature is not really going to matter. So maybe for close-up work, you would use just the incandescent bulb. I notice it says here, replace with a fresh bulb GE number 428 when replacing the battery. So that would indicate that this is probably going to get a lot more than 12 volts. It's going to get the full 45 volts of this thing when it goes off. I'm going to try and demonstrate this thing, by the way. If, if this capacitor will hold a charge, we're going to try. We're going to try this. Um, so what happens is when the capacitor is charged, you'll see the positive terminal goes to the center pin. When the camera takes a picture, it shorts the two of them together. So now the positive voltage is going up the center pin. The positive voltage is going into the terminal, which was the negative before. Um, through the bulb, through the flash bulb, dumps all the energy from the capacitor into the flash bulb, and a picture gets taken. I don't have a 45 volt battery. I do have a I do have a 30 volt power supply, so we're going to try. I'm going to put some tape on here just to insulate this thing, just so that it doesn't short out. And uh, we're going to try and uh, charge this thing up, and see whether when I short the two terminals together here, this thing should go bright if this capacitor will hold a charge. I think that's how this thing works. So um, it's not very it's not very complicated, but uh, just the way that they've engineered this thing is actually kind of cool. The way that they engineered this out, so it'll discharge the capacitor, for example, once the battery is removed. So we're just going to put some tape down there to protect the capacitor from being shorted out. That way I can charge it up if it'll take a charge, which I'm quite sure it will. This light should flash really bright when I do this because it's going to dump all the energy from this capacitor through this incandescent bulb. That's what should happen. So my power supply is not cranked up by the way now. It's, it's still only at 12 volts. So we're going to connect to the negative terminal and we're going to connect it down to here. And that should I think I should charge this capacitor up. Oh, is it? Will it? Maybe. Let's turn up the voltage here. I think that will charge it. Just measure with my meter and see whether we've got any juice on the capacitor. Or whether this capacitor is even going to take any power at this point. Looks like it's got 31 volts across it. So the capacitor should be charged. So if I take a jumper from the center pin to where the negative is on here, that should dump the energy in this capacitor through that bulb. And if there was a flash bulb on there at the same time, it would trigger the flash bulb. That's what should happen. So let's simulate, let's simulate the camera taking a picture. So I'll connect my negative terminal I guess my negative terminal, or is it? Wait a second. This is my negative terminal here. And when I touch here, and that's what happens, it will just discharge that capacitor. Takes it takes it'll take it some time to charge up again. Now remember, I'm only charging it to 32 volts. So when someone took a picture, this is what would happen. It would just flash the incandescent bulb. If there was, and of course with the, the lens on it here, we'll put the lens over the top here, you got that. Again, I'm only getting it to 32 volts. If there was a flash bulb plugged in with the optional reflector, it would trigger the flash bulb. But if not, it would just give you this little wink light 
which would give you enough light to take it up close and personal picture. Now again, I'm as I say, I'm only getting I'm only getting 30 volts on this. If this was charged to 45 volts, that light would be even that much brighter. But that's what they're doing. They're just taking this 12 volt bulb and they're just dumping 45 volts across it from this photo capacitor. Quite the uh, quite the little setup for you know someone to take close pictures. And showing here the distance. It says three three to three and a half feet. I guess says okay. Here's what here's what we're looking at here. Here's a little chart. So you would set your your exposure value to twelve, and it was good for someone being three to three and a half feet away. And if they were from uh, four to ten feet, you'd set it to eleven to ten on the dial, and then you would uh, be able to take a picture four to ten feet. And if you if you wanted to. Uh, photograph someone between 10 and 15 feet you would use a bounce flash a number five bulb with bounce flash or a number seven direct flash so there's the there's the chart there so you would plug your additional flash bulb reflector into the top there interesting that's kind of an interesting old flash I found it interesting hope you guys found that interesting let's put it back together Okay, I think that just about does it with this one. Now this can go back into my collection. Thanks for watching.